Welcome to our program in a nutshell. I'm Bob Savakanis. Today we're at the prestigious Scranton Club. The Scranton Club located in downtown Scranton is one of the oldest and as I said one of the most prestigious clubs in our area. It was founded in 1895 and has had several prominent members in the past. A former Lieutenant Governor of Pennsylvania, a former Postmaster General of the United States, and a former Supreme Court Justice of Pennsylvania. Today we have the privilege of being with the Vice President of the Scranton Club, Mr. Max Peters. Hi, Bob. Max is a local businessman. He's also an attorney. He's the Vice President of the Scranton Club, as I stated earlier. He's a University of Scranton graduate and also of the Widener School of Law. He grew up working in a junkyard, and that's a quote, so we'll get into a little bit trying to find out what that means from <laughs> his biography. He started a paving and a ceiling company when he was a freshman in college. He was the Entrepreneur of the Year Award from the Chamber of Commerce. He's lived in Hollywood and has performed in several TV shows, including the HBO series Six Feet Under, as well as several ABC sitcoms and pilot programs. He continues to be involved in making films, independent movies that is, in addition to government training videos. About six years ago, he got involved in the cigar business, more or less as a hobby. He now blends and tests cigars from the Dominican Republic. Maximilian Ultra Premium Cigars. They're 100% handmade with a limited release with tobaccos that are blended from multiple countries and aged for many months. A little bit of a background. Today we have a very unique and diverse individual in Mr. Max Peters. Max, Hi, welcome Bob. to our show. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. This is a beautiful place, the Scranton Club, and I very proudly want to say that I'm a member of the yes, Scranton Club. Yes, you are. Club. You're one of our finest members. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Yes. Tell us a little bit about the Scranton Club itself, uh, other than the beautiful ambiance that there is to offer, the food and things like that. So the Scranton Club is a, a private members-only club. Uh, it's been around for generations at this point. And uh, actually, at one point, it, it encompassed uh, this entire building in downtown Scranton, where we're sitting. Um, it, uh, as you've mentioned, there have been many dignitaries and uh, prominent uh, members of society that are members here, but uh, there's also uh, trade workers and everyday people. Uh, it's really a great place uh, for, for members to come and uh, we have a restaurant on site. We offer a lot of perks for membership, which I'm happy to go into a little more with you. But uh, uh, as you said, you're a member. and. Um, I think you, you would enjoy, you say you enjoy it here, right? I definitely enjoy the food, the atmosphere. Look at this beautiful fireplace right. for the winter season, the holidays and everything. I know it gets decorated very festive and everything. Yeah. Um, I know it also has some benefits that other clubs in the area that share uh, reciprocal agreements or something. Would you right. Know? So the, the Scranton Club offers a lot of amenities to its, its members. So not only are they allowed to come here and utilize the club itself, uh, they can uh, eat here, they can relax here. We have a full cigar bar um, and, and full regular bar here. Uh, but they offer uh, different amenities for guests like uh, gym membership to Crunch Fitness downtown. Uh, so all the members are provided a, a, a full membership to the gym. Um, they're offered discounts to different restaurants uh, uh, through town, including uh, Posh, which is right upstairs from us. Uh, um, so members can eat and order from upstairs and, and uh, eat their dinners down here uh, in the comfort of their own private club. It's an amazing place and uh, you know, I hope our audience has a chance to see some of the, the, the beautiful amenities again that it has to offer here. And, uh... and, and not only that, not to interrupt you Bob, but they also, uh, the club also offers reciprocity. Uh, and, and, and what that is essentially is by being a member here at the Scranton Club, you are given access to some of the finest private clubs around the world. Uh, so wherever you're traveling, whether it's to London, the, the St. James Club in London, which is one of the most prestigious clubs in the world, or, or if you're uh, in Chicago, if you're in Philadelphia, the Union League of Philadelphia, uh, the number one city club in, in the country, actually, um, you have access to any of those places if you're on the road, all just because you're a member here. Uh, so, and, and uh, added to that, members here get to meet and spend time with members from clubs all over the country and all over the world. So it's, a, it's really a great melting pot, I would say. Um, people gather around here, we break bread here uh, over a drink or a meal, and um, it's, it's just a great group of people. 
I know um, I tend to spend Friday nights here enjoying the dinners and everything. So the food I know again is delicious. Yes. And the drinks in the company is wonderful. Yeah. Um, and you obviously mentioned about cigars and things like that. So let's get a little bit into some of your background. Um, let's talk about the cigars. Let's, I mean, tell us about them. So uh, I would say cigars are my, uh, my passion. Uh, they, they started as a hobby, actually. Uh, I, I uh, just started smoking cigars. I had some friends that, that enjoyed cigars, got into them a little bit more, um, and, and sort of by chance ended up meeting a cigar roller uh, who, who is in the States, in, in Pennsylvania, uh, and he formerly lived in the Dominican Republic, and he was a cigar roller, they called him a torcedor, uh, for the Fuente Company in, uh, in the Dominican Republic. And he rolled what's known as the Opus X cigar. So if you're familiar with cigars, that's, that's sort of one of the creme de la creme of cigars. It's, uh, they're, they're pretty expensive, they're pretty rare, they're known as being one of the best tasting cigars. And uh, this, this friend of mine uh, had 14 years of experience rolling those cigars. And he moved to Pennsylvania to uh, be with some family here. We met, and uh, he sort of became my pipeline to learning about the industry and tasting different cigars. And it eventually turned into uh, him helping me purchase some tobaccos from the Dominican Republic, uh, various different uh, blends and uh, not blends, but various different uh, crops of tobacco, and started to experiment. And it was really not meant to be a business. Um, sort of, I, I tell people everything I do in life, it's all about business and the bottom line and making money. And the cigars were never about that. And they, they still to this day are not. Um, it's really just a passion. So we, we started messing around with different blends. And uh, fast forward, I would say almost three years before. Um, I ended up with a blend that I was proud enough to uh, put my name on and share with people, um, but the, it's been it's been a really exciting uh, journey. So, for those of us that aren't too familiar with the cigar making process or something, um, you go to the Dominican Republic, I assume, mm -hmm. several times. Yep. Um, tell us a little bit about what the process is like as far as selecting tobacco leaves, products, things like that. I would say, Bob, the best comparison uh, for the cigar industry is like any other high-end um, product. So wines, uh, whiskeys, uh, anything like that where there's a there's almost an artistic element to it. There's a there's a, a romance of selection of, of different if it's wine with grapes, uh, there's time at play with aging. Um, so I would say it's very, it's very, it's a very romantic process, uh, and, and 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 you know it all starts with selecting the leaves. You know it all starts with selecting the blend that you're going to utilize in making the cigar, and then you would take those leaves and and after making a few different combinations and trying them out, um, you may come up with what you would think is a fantastic cigar. So you could. You could select, in my cigar particularly, there's uh, tobaccos from three different countries. You might put together this great blend of tobaccos and smoke it, and it's terrible. Um, and then you might put that cigar on the shelf and let it age for three months, completely forget about it, come back to it, and it's completely different. And that's why I liken it to being like wine or whiskey. You know, sometimes it's all about the sweet spot of time. And inversely, you could make a cigar that tastes great today, and uh, time doesn't treat it well uh, in aging. So that's that's why it took us, uh, I would say, three years to come out with this blend. Just just trying to dial in all of those variables. So we look at the smoking industry. I mean, cig the cigarette industry is suffering a lot. You know, a lot of people are shying away yes. from cigarette smoking and everything. But cigar smoking seems to have become more and more popular, more in vogue, if you want to call it that, in the last several years. What's your thoughts on that as far as your business expanding, in addition, your hobby expanding? Yeah, um, that's a great point. I mean, it's <laughs> cigars are in a bit of a tough spot um, as far as regulations right now. Uh, they're 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 in a they're in a position where they're they're trying to be regulated as if they were the same as cigarettes, which um, I don't I don't personally care if you smoke cigarettes, you smoke cigars, or what. But there's a there's a difference in the product. 
Um, you don't find young kids trying to go buy a $15 cigar. Uh, so when you're regulating them the same way, there tends to be this disconnect. Um, so I, I do think it's, I do think year over year, it's a hobby that grows. Uh, and I think it's because it's, it's something that everyone can take part in for the most part. Uh, it's not, maybe, maybe in other generations, it was known as sort of a, an old man's hobby. Um, but it, you've been here at the Scranton Club. You know, we have young members, old members, women, men, different ethnicities. I mean, it, it, and it's not, just to, it's not just here in the Scranton Club. I mean, I travel around to cigar shops and cigar bars all over the world, and it's a hobby that brings people together across every different uh, measure. And uh, I really think that's why it's, uh, I th really think that's why it just sort of continues to expand as a hobby. And I think it's, it, the way you summed it up, it, it really is a, a good way to look at it. It's, it's something that you come to appreciate over time, sure. whether it's wine, whether it's um, antique cars, right. things like that. Yeah, when was the last, you know, what else do people uh, do on their daily lives anymore that requires them to sort of stop, you know, put the phone down, take a half an hour, an hour, and uh, work at something, you know, you, you sit there and you, it, it's sort of a great opportunity to sit with your own thoughts. And um, I always say the, um, the, the therapeutic value of smoking a cigar, <laughs> at least this is what I tell myself, far outweighs the, uh, the health risk. So you have, and it's always the legendary Cuban cigar. Sure. What makes the Cuban tobacco leaf so fantastic, if you want to call it that, as opposed to other tobacco products? Well, I, I, might, uh, I might be deemed unpopular for this opinion, um, but uh, I, I, don't, I don't see the same gold in Cuban cigars that everyone else does. Uh, I think at one point they were certainly the cream of the crop, pun intended. Uh, they, were, uh, they were great cigars, and they still manufacture excellent cigars. But I would say with cigars from any country, uh, it, it really is all about the specific crop, the specific seed, the specific plant, and then beyond that, it's the cigar roller. It's how the cigar is rolled. Uh, there's different styles. It's how it's aged and is fermented and then aged. There's all these different variables, and I would say I've smoked just as many terrible Cuban cigars um, as I've smoked excellent uh, cigars from other countries. You know, today the Dominican Republic, I would say, Dominican Republic especially, I mean, that's where I choose to make my cigars, but uh, Honduras, Nicaragua, they are pumping out far superior cigars right now, uh, in, in my opinion. Uh, not to say, not to say there aren't excellent Cuban cigars, but uh, just because it's a Cuban cigar, I think there's, uh, I think there's an allure there. It's like the forbidden fruit. You know, you're not supposed to have them, so they must be the best. Um, but uh, and and really, you know, myself included, we are blending with Cuban seeds. Uh, so so we are growing the same types of uh, species of tobacco plants that they're growing in Cuba. We're growing them in the Dominican Republic or in Honduras or in Nicaragua. So uh, there's obviously soil differentiations that, that change the aspect of the, the crop. But uh, you really, you, you really it, it all comes down to preference. Uh, it all comes down to what you like. So as far as marketing your cigars, I mean, tell me a little bit about what the process is. I mean, do you go and visit trade shows, obviously pre-COVID? Um, do you go to cigar bars to talk about your product for presentations? So tell us yeah. a little bit about what that's like. So we, um, the intention with the Maximilian Cigars was always to keep it pretty small and limited. Um, the types of tobaccos, the rare aged tobaccos that we put in the cigar, uh, make it so that we can't, we can't make a cigar for everybody in the world. There's just not enough of that high-end tobacco. Uh, there's only so much of it that gets aged every year. So um, we keep it small and uh, we, we, we don't necessarily market to try to sell everybody and their, and their grandmother uh, one of our cigars. Um, I would say uh, we, we actually only my brand uh, in particular, but I think you'll find it with a lot of smaller 
boutique, we'll call them, type cigar companies, uh, they tend to only sell to brick and mortar stores, so physical cigar shop retailers. Um, and that is done uh, really in its simplest form to support the small business, uh, the mom and pop type cigar shops that you see closing their doors uh, every day. Um, there are some great big Goliath uh, cigar companies out there with catalogs and online uh, presence where people buy their cigars from. I've bought cigars from them for years um, and they're great. They serve a great purpose because they bring people into the hobby. They, they allow this uh, low barrier to entry for people who want to try a bunch of different cigars and they can do so very inexpensively. Um, but we, we don't sell to those big companies, those big catalogs, because we would have to do so at such a discount, we'd be undercutting the small little uh, mom and pop shop. So that's really where our bread and butter is. That's, uh, that's where I choose to uh, market and sell the cigars. Uh, I, try to, I try to bring them in. I, I, when I go, when I travel, if I'm on the road for business or, or whatever, vacation, I scope out where the local cigar shops are and uh, that's, that's my first stop go in and, and, and meet the manager, who, whoever's in charge, and give them some cigars, let them try it. It's a, like I said in the beginning, it's a very low pressure sale. You know, I'm not in there, uh, I'm, not, I'm not leaving until I make a sale, it's not like that. Uh, I, I wanna share the cigar with them. A lot of these people that, that own these cigar shops or run the cigar shops or just work there, they love cigars. You know, they love trying new stuff and, and uh, so me being able to share that with them uh, generally results in getting a call a few days or weeks later saying, hey, my guys really loved your cigar, you know, how do we, how do we buy them? So uh, then we end up opening a new account and uh, that, that's, that's how we market the cigars. So looking at uh, one of those cigars, what is, the, what is the process to make that cigar this from beginning to end, from the picking of the sure. tobacco leaf to so, um, somebody sitting enjoying it here? Yeah, that's, uh, that, that's actually it's, it's the part of the process that I really fell in love with, uh, with, with making the cigars. And first thing you need to do is, is plant the seeds. Uh, you, need to, you need to have the land and you, you plant the crop. And there's a, a process of trimming the leaves. There are certain parts of the plant that you can't use right away. There are certain parts that you, you sort of uh, you cut the leaves and they, they get sold to go into cigarettes or cheaper machine-made type cigars. So when you're making a, a high-end handmade cigar, um, you're, really, you're doing a lot of work for a very little yield from one plant. Uh, so uh, the next thing that you do after, after cutting the leaves uh, from these plants is you have to dry them out. And they, there's, there's large drying barns that are usually right in the middle of the tobacco fields. Um, and every, every leaf, believe it or not, is uh, strung by hand, uh, needle and thread, uh, through on, on a long string. So they're harvesting hundreds of thousands of leaves in a day. Um, and they are hung from the rafters. They have to completely dry out. Um, it's very low tech. It's far more uh, low tech than you would assume. However, the people doing it, uh, I would put my faith in them over any computer or testing gadget. Uh, they just know. Uh, they look at it, they touch it, they smell it, they taste it. Um, they know uh, when it's right. They dry it out. Um, the leaves then go into these huge piles called pilones uh, where they ferment. They essentially heat themselves from the inside out um, and the tobacco ferments itself, which is another timing process. After that, uh, you can, you know, once they're completely dry and, and uh, they would go into an aging barn. So we're probably already six months into this process uh, and, and we've not rolled a single cigar um, and that, that tobacco could then be aged a couple of months, could be aged a couple of years. Some of the tobaccos in my cigar are, you know, aged over three years before they even see the cigar. So once that's all done, you have to accumulate all these tobaccos after they've been sorted and separated by color and size. Um, you sit them in front of the, the torcedor, the cigar roller, who basically the cigar has three components. There's, there's the filler, which is the 
central part, the middle of the, the cigar. The binder, which is a sort of a, a rudimentary leaf kind of chopped up, but that holds all the smaller leaves together. And then finally, there's a wrapper leaf, which is sort of that pristine, perfect big leaf, uh, one big leaf that they wrap the whole cigar in. Um, and all three of those components are made up of different tobaccos, different blends. So that, that all plays into making the cigar taste the way that it does. So once they've made it, uh, it goes into a, a press to sort of seal in that, that shape. Um, and it's probably aged again till they're ready to smoke. Probably for most of us in northeastern Pennsylvania, the closest we would come to tobacco growing might be the Lancaster area or something. Yes. I mean, are you familiar with? Absolutely. So and what is that tobacco used for and what, what are your thoughts on, on the so, tobacco down there? Uh, I would say until maybe uh, five years ago or so, the only big uh, U.S. tobacco that was being used in like premium handmade cigars would be the Connecticut Leaf wrapper, which a lot of people are familiar with. Um, but, but nowadays, uh, there are, um, I think, um, I think J.C. Newman, which is a, another great uh, company uh, out of Tampa, Florida, they're, they're utilizing tobaccos from only the USA. So Lancaster tobaccos, Connecticut tobaccos, Kentucky tobaccos, I'm not quite sure where they sourced all of them from, but um, it has really become Great stuff. I mean, some of they've, they've some of these cigar companies have brought up their their best and brightest from their respective countries: Honduras, Nicaragua, Dominican Republic, and they're using those techniques here in the states. And you end up with this great product because we have a totally different soil consistency. Our weather is different, uh, and uh, it, it's a great it's a great door that has opened for us uh, as well moving forward with our new blends it's something that we're looking to incorporate into making our cigars well i think we've talked a lot about cigars max let's yeah. talk a little bit about max peters himself okay so we read a little bit i you know i took it off of your bio and everything and it said you started your um working days in a junkyard what does that mean so um I, 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 it's as simple as that. Uh, my, uh, my grandfather, who uh, is the, the former mayor of Scranton, Gene Peters, uh, his, uh, one of his great friends uh, owns a, a junkyard nearby here in Scranton. And uh, he used to take me there on Saturday mornings for his coffee with his buddy. And uh, I just be, was hooked. You know, I wanted to go every Saturday. Then it turned into every Saturday and Sunday. Then it turned into all my summers uh, when I was off school. and, and uh, I just sort of fell in love with working on stuff, you know, being outside, working around trucks and equipment, and uh, it, it's, uh, I still to this day, in fact, I was there earlier this morning uh, just helping some friends there, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great group of guys, it's a great, uh, it's a great way to be hands-on, and you get to be around big trucks and equipment and all the stuff that I like, so it's a good deal. I must congratulate you, though. I mean, you really are the third generation that I'm aware of being successful in your family. I mean, as you mentioned, your grandfather, the former mayor here in Scranton, yeah. and still very active in the community. And your dad, Joe Peters, I know, has worked in the two prior White House administrations, uh, serving as a drug czar and things like that. And, of course, with your success as a businessman and an attorney and everything like that. So, uh, yeah. again, the Peters family has done a lot in northeastern Pennsylvania in the Scranton area and everything. Thanks. So. Um, tell me a little bit about your acting career, though. I, I read a little bit on there that you've been involved and lived in L.A. for a while in yeah. Hollywood. Tell us a little bit about your experiences. Well, I was, um, I was, I was uh, pretty young, probably 12 or 13 years old, and uh, I was uh, going to school in Washington, Washington D.C. at the time, and uh, my, my father stuck me in an after school, after school program, an etiquette class, which I was so furious about it. You know, he let me pick, he let me pick one of the classes and he got to pick one. So I picked karate and he picked etiquette. And uh, uh, in that class, it just so happened that there was a, um, a friend of the teacher was in visiting, uh, just visiting her friend who was teaching the class. And she was an acting coach and uh, she, was, she, she was from the West Coast, and she was in town for a little while. And uh, long story short, I and spent some time with her, met with her, and she felt that I should uh, take some time and go out to Los Angeles and try my hand at it. And I'm sure my parents thought it was some sort of a scam to, you know, where do you, where do you write the check and send, who do you send it to? And, uh, but I did, I, I moved out to Hollywood, and 
ended up signing with an agent and a manager right away. And the hope was, you know, if I liked it, which I, I thought I did, um, that I would get some time and, and do some acting lessons and maybe have the opportunity to, to get some auditions and just sort of get a feel for what it's like out there. And I ended up getting some auditions and booking some roles on some major shows right away, which was uh, kind of blew us all away. I didn't expect to do it. My parents certainly didn't. Uh, so I ended up with an apartment out there and, and uh, filmed some different TV shows, HBO and uh, some pilots uh, on ABC and some sitcoms. And um, it, it, was, it was really a, a cool time uh, as like a young guy out there uh, all of a sudden having assistants and agents and managers and uh, money that, I mean, I, I, you couldn't buy that much candy, you know what I mean? It was, um, it was a really fun experience. And I, I came back east, came back to Pennsylvania to sort of finish school. That was the plan and get back out there uh, at some point considering the success that I had. And life just sort of takes over. I ended up staying back here. I wanted to go to college. I wanted to start a business. And I did all that and, and um, ended up going to law school at night while working all day. And uh, I still say at some point I'm going to go back out there. But I stay involved. I, I, I do some stuff behind the camera now and uh, some production work. Um, so I, I, still get my, I still get my kicks. So again, just looking at your background, being an attorney, being a businessman, um coming from a, a very important family in our area, Northeastern PA, um, you know, what's, what's the next roles for Max? Where is Max going next? With, where, where do you see yourself moving in the well, next Well, I, uh, I would say it's definitely big shoes to fill. You mentioned uh, my, my grandfather and my father. Um, I'm, I'm just a cigar salesman, you know. Uh, um, I, uh, I've, I've been, been developing my legal practice. Um, uh, we, we, we service clients actually throughout the country right now. Um, sort of a concierge legal approach. So uh, we, we, we represent you know, larger companies and we sort of handle everything for them. So whether it's uh, criminal law type stuff or corporate business law, uh, whether we handle it directly or we serve as sort of their pipeline to finding them a specialist lawyer and whatever they need. Uh, that's, that's the type of legal work that, that we've been doing. And, uh, you know, I, I spend my, my time sort of growing the cigar business. That's what I really enjoy doing and uh, still doing some of the production and film work. And I'm, I'm an open door, you know, sort of every day. Whatever, 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 the, whatever the ether is willing to throw my way, I'm always open for an opportunity. And that's, that's, that's what I enjoy. You know, I never saw myself as being a lawyer sitting behind a desk all day doing the same thing, writing, a, writing legal briefs or handling divorces or anything like that. So uh, I try to keep an open mind. I, I love anything uh, entrepreneurial. I love the aspect of starting new businesses or, or uh, helping two people bring a business together, or things like that. That's, that's how the law has sort of helped me do that. But uh, every day is a new day. Well, again, I want to thank you, uh, Max Peters, and your family, your dad, the former mayor, uh, excuse me, your grandfather, the former yes. mayor, and your dad, for all that he's done in the community, being so much involved, and you certainly are very successful in what you've been doing here as well. So this is Bob Savikanis in a nutshell.